Today we talk about why you think you're ovulating, but in reality, you're not. I'm Dr. Mark Amos, and this is Taco About Fertility Tuesday. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, is he going to pretend that he didn't do a podcast in the last nine months and not even talk about it? And the answer is no. Um, I do apologize. COVID was very difficult, uh, not just on our business, but also in my family. Um, I was very fortunate to not have anyone pass away from COVID, but it did affect my kids and my family. And it took a lot of time away from me that I had to get to my family. And so I know many of you like these podcasts and I had to put it down for a while. Now that we're coming out of the COVID world, I'm able to do these again. And so I just want to let you know, I plan on doing these again. And I thank everyone who listened to them and all the people who asked me to start them again. A common concern that patients have when going through any type of treatment is what if they ovulate before you want them to ovulate? The concern would be potentially the sperm will not be at the right place when it's supposed to be, especially if you're using donor sperm because now you're not even having relations, having sperm around at other times. And so, It's a very valid concern, but the thing is, most of the concerns that people have are really not needed. To understand this, you have to first know what causes ovulation. From an outsider's view, you would just assume it's the size of the follicle. I mean, that's what the doctor is measuring. But in reality, it's not directly due to the size of the follicle. It's actually due to the estrogen being made by the follicle. There is no egg receptor measure in your body, but instead, as that estrogen gets closer to the level it needs to ovulate, usually around 200 picogram, your body will then start the process of ovulation by releasing a high dose of luteinizing hormone, also called LH, to make you ovulate. This is why ovulation kits, check LH because LH precedes the ovulation. Now, ovulation kits really are called pre-ovulation kits or ovulation detection, but in reality, you're not looking at ovulation. You're just looking at the hormone that is going to cause ovulation. Whereas the only hormone you can look at to know that you ovulate is progesterone. But the problem with progesterone is it only rises days afterwards, not right away. So if you were using progesterone to find out if you ovulated, it would be after the fact. And that wouldn't help you much if you're trying to get pregnant and get the timing correct. Other natural methods that people use to determine if they're going to ovulate is to look at their cervical mucus. And it will change as they get closer to ovulation and usually precedes it by a day or two. Many women will also notice that their vaginal discharge starts to increase and starts to get this kind of whitest discharge. Now, at first thought, it would seem like all of these things, the increase in cervical mucus, the increase in the vaginal discharge, all this is due to ovulation occurring. But in reality, it's actually not. Everything that we are talking about is due to estrogen. And this is really important because when you are worried about ovulating, what you're really worried about are the associations you have made between ovulation and the symptoms you have. This means that if you do have those symptoms and you are just naturally ovulating, you're probably correct. Because in that situation, when the estrogen is elevated, it probably is around the time that you're ovulating. 
However, when you are in a treatment cycle, whether that be artificial insemination or IVF, it's a little bit different now because now you're taking medications that can cause estrogen levels to rise faster and you're taking medications sometimes to prevent ovulation. But the symptoms you get will still be due to the estrogen. And so it's going to make you feel like you're ovulating, but in reality, you're not. Let's start with artificial insemination, also called IUIs, intrauterine inseminations. So the common time I get patients worried about the follicles ovulating is not just the symptoms, but sometimes what they see on the ultrasound. When the follicle gets really large, many patients get worried that they're going to ovulate. And that's a pretty fair thing to think. But in that situation, it's the estrogen that matters, not how big the follicle is. So for example, I had a patient going through and she only had one follicle. And in that situation, I will let that follicle get bigger, sometimes up to 20 millimeters in size, maybe even 22 if her estrogen level is low. However, if I have multiple follicles growing, the estrogen level will go up faster. So even when the follicles are smaller at 17, 18 millimeters, the estrogen level will rise. And that could then induce ovulation. Now we'll get into what you can do about that to prevent that. But the point is, when you're watching the ultrasounds, don't be so worried about the follicle getting too large. What you should worry about is, is the estrogen going up? Now, if you have a large follicle and you have those symptoms and it's just one follicle, you should be worried that you're about to ovulate. And the easiest thing to do is you can check an LH and an estrogen level and you can determine if you are ovulating or if you're about to ovulate. If that estrogen level is around 200, you're about ready to ovulate. So you haven't missed anything yet, which is great. Now, if your doctor is triggering you earlier than that, let's say at 16 millimeters, well, then you have to think, well, how many follicles do I have? If you have multiple follicles, the estrogen level rises faster. So you're going to get all those symptoms and you're going to ovulate sooner. Now, clearly there's a balance here. If you get too many follicles when they're very early and size isn't very big, they may not be mature. So then you run this battle of, okay, I got to trigger them earlier, but I don't want to trigger them too early. And in that situation, that's where medications called antagonists come into play that can prevent you from ovulating. Common names for those are ganarelics. There's another one called cetratide. So if I have a patient who has a whole bunch of 14 millimeter follicles, let's say like six of them, then I'm going to give them a med like cetratide or ganarelics to let those follicles get to the appropriate size they need to without them ovulating early. So in summary, if you have fewer follicles, they can get larger before you trigger. If you have more follicles, you have to trigger earlier, otherwise you're going to miss ovulation. And if there are too many follicles and the estrogen level is rising too fast, then the best thing to do at that point is to prevent ovulation by using an antagonist such as cetratide or ganarelics. Now keep in mind, I am simplifying this a little bit. The follicles do have to be a certain size with the estrogen level being elevated to ovulate. But in general, you can kind of use this to understand how things work. Now, when we talk about IVF, it is a whole different beast because now you are not trying to trigger before natural ovulation. You're actually preventing ovulation completely. So the different type of IVF cycles out there include what's called an agonist cycle, an antagonist cycle, and a co-flare, also called microdose cycles. 
in the Agnes cycle, you are taking a med like Lupron. And what that does is that shuts down your pituitary so you don't make the hormones to ovulate. So in the Lupron cycle, you shut everything down. And then that way, only the hormones we are giving will make estrogen levels rise when the eggs grow. But when the estrogen level gets to the point it's going to trigger the eggs release, the brain's not really working right now because you shut it down with the Lupron. In the situation with the antagonist, what you're doing is similar to what we did in the artificial insemination cycle. You are giving a medication to block the body's signal to make you ovulate. And we usually start that pretty early, usually by day six. And that will prevent you from ovulating. The last cycle we talked about is coflare cycles or microdose lupron cycles, which actually works just like the lupron cycle. The only difference is in the first three days, it's going to stimulate the pituitary gland to release FSH, which will then make the follicles grow. Then, after those three days, it's going to then suppress the pituitary gland, similar to how the Lupron did from the beginning, and that's going to prevent you from ovulating. But the thing is, in all of these cycles, it's not going to prevent your body from increasing the estrogen levels. And so that means. In the IVF cycle, you're going to notice that your cervical mucus is changing. And in the past, you've always associated that with ovulation. But in this situation, it's actually just estrogen rising. The same thing with vaginal discharge. You're going to notice an increase in your vaginal discharge because when you make estrogen levels high, it causes production of vaginal discharge. And so again, don't associate that with ovulation, associate it with the elevated estrogen levels. Now, this information I'm giving you does not mean you shouldn't talk to your doctor if you're worried about ovulating early, because there may be situations where you are because of issues that are going on. This is more just to help you not be nervous about it for a common thing that most women think when going through the IVF cycle. And it's not like these cycles are already not very stressful. And then to think that you may be ovulating early, you start to think, I just ruined the entire cycle. But in reality, very few people ovulate before retrieval. With regards to ovulating past the medications like Lupron and the antagonist. Where a lot of people may ovulate is between the point of taking the trigger and the point of doing the retrieval. But that's a different discussion on a different day. I hope this episode will be helpful to some of you who do get nervous during the cycles and may even prevent some people from getting nervous if they listen to it prior to their IVF cycle. As always, if you have any questions, you can always send them to tbft at newdirectionfertility.com. That's Talk About Fertility Tuesday, TBFT at newdirectionfertility.com. Thank you again to all the people who sent me emails and personally told me they missed the podcast and wanted me to start it up again. It's because of you guys that I did, and I thank you for helping me start it up again. Until next week, and I do mean that, this is Talk About Fertility Tuesday. Fertility Tuesday.